Welcome to Unit 3. At the end of Unit 2, we learned a little bit about how France at the end of the 17th century became wealthy and powerful overnight, and King Louis XIV just couldn't help but show off that newfound wealth. And so French Baroque art ended up being a lot more decorative and a lot more opulent, a lot less dramatic than other types of Baroque art. And Louis XIV, of course, is remembered in history for building this place, the Palace of Versailles, which is absolutely immense in scale and immense in decorative objects. It's dripping with gold, it's dripping with glass and crystal, and is just decorated up to its teeth. And that sets the stage for the Rococo style of the 18th century. So Rococo really was a French style, but it ended up becoming popular internationally. And so this is a palace in, in uh, Austria with a mural of the marriage of Emperor Frederick and Beatrice of Burgundy. And this, so this is a prime example of the Rococo style. The Rococo style is going to be characterized by aristocratic subjects. So rich people, rich, powerful people, and soft pastel colors. It's a very decorative style. And soft forms, soft shapes, soft lines, soft textures. Everything that looks pretty, that's going to look good in your palace or in your country chateau or in your salon over your couch. And in fact... The granddaddy of Rococo art was a Frenchman named Jean-Antoine Watteau. And he invented a brand new genre of subject matter for paintings. He called it a fête galant. And fête galant is just a fancy French way to say a fancy party. So this is what was popular at the dawn of the 18th century. Paintings of rich people having parties. And this partly has to do with the fact that Louis XIV's successor, Louis XV, actually moved the capital away from Versailles and actually moved it back to Paris, which was a good administrative decision. But the court had grown so much that he actually needed to commission lots and lots of art to fill these new, smaller residences in the city of Paris. So Madame du Barry... Louis XV's mistress commissions a whole series about love, but she rejects it, believe it or not, in favor of the new stylish thing, which is neoclassical art. Now, neoclassical art, in many ways, is the opposite of Rococo. It is inspired by the Enlightenment. And the, the Enlightenment was a mid-18th century emphasis on philosophy and science and reason. And so this painting by Sir Joseph Wright of Derby shows a scientist at work, but actually uses tenebrism, which was applied to religious paintings in the past. So he's implying that science is the new religion. Josiah Wedgwood is an English ceramicist who is promoting enlightenment values. This plaque, Am I Not a Man and a Brother? This was a uh, plaque that raised awareness about abolition of the Atlantic slave trade. And so the qualities of freedom and brotherhood and equality that will come to will come to define the French Revolution were the cornerstones of the Enlightenment. Now Josiah Wedgwood, most of his ceramics were actually inspired by ancient Greece and ancient Rome. And this is the hallmark of neoclassical art, hence the name, neoclassical, new classical. It's another revival of interest in the past. So the silhouetted figures on uh, Wedgwood's vases are inspired by the silhouetted figures on ancient Greek pottery, like this example by Exechius. 
And that is very, very typical of neoclassical art. We're going to see a lot of paintings as well that are inspired by classical Greek and classical Roman themes. So in a lot of ways, the neoclassical style is kind of like a mini 18th century renaissance, almost a revival of the renaissance, but without the religious subject matter. Now, it was actually the discovery of Pompeii in the 18th century that inspired all of this newfound interest in the classical world. Now, Pompeii was a tiny Roman city in southern, on the southern tip of the peninsula that is today known as Italy, and it was buried in volcanic ash uh, right near the end of the, the first century AD. And when it was discovered, this caused a fad for everything Roman and everything Greek. So this painting by the female 18th century painter, Angelica Kaufman, um, illustrates a Roman story about a woman who doesn't go for material possessions. Her treasures are her children. And so she's a perfect example of 18th century virtue, of a, a matriarch who knows her place, and yet this is all shown through the guise of Roman values. And this is also true of Marie Antoinette. Uh, Marie Antoinette is the wife of Louis XVI, and they are very unpopular, very, very unpopular rulers. So she gets the female artist of Elizabeth Vigée Le Brun to try to show her as a devoted mother, to try and make over her public image a little bit. Now, Marie Antoinette and her husband, Louis XVI, would be overthrown in the French Revolution of 1789, and Jacques-Louis David would eventually become the official painter of the revolution. But in 1784, he couldn't exactly just make a painting that blatantly advocated politi political uprising, so he used ancient Greek and Roman subject matter to advocate loyalty, loyalty to a cause, but he uses the ancient Roman story, the Oath of the Horatii, and he shows three young sons of Horus. They're giving an oath, an oath of loyalty to their father, and they're getting ready to go out and kill a competing clan, and they might, they might themselves sacrifice their own lives, so they're willing to sacrifice for what it, they believe in, and therefore Jacques-Louis David is calling for modern viewers to make sacrifices for their loyalties. And in fact, this painting, The Death of Marat, is also a call to arms. It is a memorial for a fallen revolutionary named Jean-Paul Marat, who was murdered in his bathtub. He suffered from a skin condition. Uh, by a woman who was a royalist and she was tired of all of the violence of the revolution. Now, David eventually became the official painter of Napoleon Bonaparte, the young general who rose to become first consul, the, a leader among equals who established peace and order in France after the revolution. And this painting shows him in the most heroic light possible as he's leading his troops across the Alps at the St. Bernard Pass. The founding fathers of our country here in the United States were also Enlightenment thinkers who valued equality and fraternity and these important Enlightenment values that establish the, the founding doctrine of the United States. And so they brought in French neoclassical artists and architects like Jean-Antoine Houdon to create classically inspired portraits and buildings that really became the visual program of this young country. So you don't have to go to France to see neoclassical art and architecture. And in fact, Thomas Jefferson himself was an amateur architect who designed his own home at Monticello. You'll notice that the, the dome and the columns are very much inspired by ancient Roman architecture and much more restrained, much less decorative, and much less opulent than, say, the Palace of Versailles. And as we move into the later 18th century and the dawn of the 19th century, romantic art becomes all the, all the, the new craze. And 
Ang. By the way, his name is not pronounced Ingress, it is Ang. Ang becomes the new official painter for Napoleon Bonaparte, who in 1804 crowns himself emperor and needs a really new type of visual style to go along with his new role that betrays many of his early supporters. Ang is a romantic in the sense that he's interested in the subjective, the exotic, the emotional. So his Grand Odalisque is obviously a French model, but she's painted as an Odalisque, a, a slave girl in a sultan's harem. So she's surrounded by fine silks and a hookah, and she's wearing a turban. And she's, she's very much a fantasy in the sense that her body is elongated and distorted. Uh, Gro becomes the next official painter for Napoleon, and he paints hit Napoleon's military exploits in North Africa and the Near East, and again, is interested in the exotic, is interested in the violent. Here, Napoleon is reaching out to touch his troops who are infected with plague. Ew. Um, but this is, again, a way to try to make over his image after he poisoned some of those very same infected troops. Jericho paints the Raft of the Medusa as a critique of a corrupt government that, without any regulation, basically allows for inept people to crash ships and let the survivors live on a raft and resort to cannibalism. So this is all about violence and emotion and turbulence and is, is very dark. And Goya also is interested in the darker side of life. He's a Spanish romantic who is critical of Napoleon's troops who are occupying Spain and are uh, executing peasants who revolt point blank. And so Goya paints very dark, very textured, brushy style paintings that are critical of the... Napoleon's troops and um... and in the sleep of reason produces monsters Goya is criticizing the monarchy of Charles the fourth Charles the fourth censored enlightenment literature from reaching Spain and Goya here creates an allegory or a symbolic representation of reason who is asleep on the job and so ignorance allows all of the creepy crawlies of the night to run free. And so Goya embodies the values of the Enlightenment in some ways. And so it's important to keep in mind that Romanticism doesn't fully reject the Enlightenment, but feels that it's not the whole picture and that human existence also includes a rich emotional life and a rich natural life and that the the supernatural the exotic and the emotional are very very important qualities